This is where the sharpest ideas are forged. And some wonky ones too. I grew up with a lot of, you know, white friends, but all my white friends had one non-white friend. <laughs> and, uh... Thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I think, I think comedy suffers when you only have like one type of perspective, you know what I mean? Migration is part of the human condition. Everybody is a migrant, which is objectively not true. I, as a matter of policy at the comedy pub, don't want to tell, ever tell anybody what they can joke about or not. Comedy as a genre is probably the most honest way of, of portraying what our current societal values are. What is yellow and plays the guitar? John Lemon. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> See? She asked See? for it. Proof that even in academia... <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to Standard Time. I am Reka Kinga Pop, your host and editor-in-chief of Eurozine, a magazine behind this show. Eurozine is an online magazine that connects over 100 culture journals, reaching a global audience. We also take pride in being a founding member of the Display Europe platform, where we present diverse content from across Europe in 15 languages. It's our New Year's episode, so amid all the merrymaking, I'll be the party pooper, because today we will discuss Who's allowed to joke about what? A few years ago, people complained about political correctness. Today the call is on cancel culture. It sometimes goes as far as show business billionaires complaining about how they just can't say things anymore because women or trans people or abuse survivors, sometimes even homeless folks and other tyrants just won't know how to take a joke. These poor oppressed folks do mostly their complaining on primetime shows too. Now, I have a lot of actual existing things to cry about, so I cannot quite spare a tear for them. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't advocate in favor of respecting authorities too much. By me, you can make fun of any church or the police, the state, public personas, all politicians, left, right and center. I love a fart joke as much as the next person, and I especially enjoy making people feel awkward by bringing up gonorrhea all the time. Are you sure you don't have gonorrhea? Super gonorrhea? Gonorrhea. But I do prefer to avoid punching down. Not necessarily avoiding topics, but to choose wisely at whose expense I extract a laugh to fill the ever-expanding void in my soul that only an audience can fill for fleeting moments. So instead of all the cancel culture foolishness, let's turn the tables and see what some not-so-billionaire comedians and thinkers recommend we sharpen our wits against. Tonight we have a set of guests whose jokes tend to chafe and burn in just the right places. Comedian Ashlyn Kane is here to tell us where to put our pronouns. She's the founder of Gays and Days Comedy in Vienna and brings a rowdy California girl energy. Historian Yanis Panayoditis is the scientific director of Vretset, the research center for the history of transformation at the University of Vienna. He specialized in the history of migration. He'll measure his observations with a scholarly spoon, but behold, because his remarks do, in fact, cut sometimes. And Homer Hakim will show us what an Afghan really looks like. Spoiler, it's not what most Austrians expect. He's the comedy daddy, the owner of the comedy pub on Wiedner Hauptstrasse, the only club dedicated fully to stand-up in Vienna. He's a comic himself, of course. Let's see who gets cancelled today. Hi, welcome. Thanks for taking the time. Homer, some Austrians don't seem to recognize where you're from, or not necessarily recognize, but they are baffled that they don't see on your face where you're from. The first reaction kind of moment where people are like, oh, you don't look like an Afghan because the one Afghan, the one other Afghan that they know doesn't look exactly like me. So I 
I usually now just say yes, I'm not a carpet. Another thing, <laughs> Afghan thing is a carpet. Yeah, it's fair. As a comedy club owner and, the, you know, in charge of the programming there, somebody comes in, I guess you don't tell them what they can joke about. I haven't had this experience with you so far. But when somebody you feel like are going too far, what is the line for you that you wouldn't want to tolerate or wouldn't necessarily prefer having on your stage? Um, to be honest, I, as a matter of policy at the Comedy Pub, don't want to tell, ever tell anybody what they can joke about or not. Because stand-up comedy is a very direct uh, art form. You do a joke, it's either funny or it's not, and you get instant feedback from the, from the audience. We, we do a lot of open mics, so a lot of people try out new stuff. I'm always very careful with them. I want to set up people for success, and I know if you are, if you just, you know, with your first joke, alienate the audience completely, you're not gonna do well, and you're not gonna have a good time, the audience is not gonna have a good time, and that way it will be just a terrible experience for everybody. Ashlyn, you are organizer, you are the co-founder of Gays and Days, a comedy ensemble. Uh, we organize events, we provide platforms to uh, people who look for LGBT comedians who are already established, and um, we provide platform for new people who uh, want to try out material for LGBT comic, or people who basically might not have felt so comfortable on a normal, like regular stage uh, otherwise, because I, I think it's, I think Homer will agree with me on this, that uh, stand-up comedy has not exactly been a, a traditionally welcoming medium to a lot of people of our persuasion. I don't know, I think, I think comedy suffers when you don't have, when you only have like one type of perspective, you know what I mean? Vienna specifically, but also this wider cultural context has this very long tradition of the cabaret mm -hmm. and theatrical traditions. Stand-up feels like an implant here, a quite, a quite a, and quite a recent implant. It's a very sort of Anglo-Saxon thing. And maybe that's also the reason why the majority of people that I see doing stand-up, including in German, mm -hmm. have some kind of a migration background or are recent implants themselves. Does the migrant perspective, do you think, have to do something with this intermixing of humors? Or is that like, is, is a joke necessary when you're negotiating the circumstances that you're facing? How do you see that? Or are you just a funny person and that just happens to be so? Well, first of all, I'm a German citizen. Can yes. I, can I say that? Can Important. Say that? Yes. Uh, Jokes help with uh, negotiating a lot of things. Once you start having sort of diversity in humor, you will have, I think you will necessarily have different groups poking fun at each other, for instance, because that's, you know, many of the best jokes are about um, inoffensive stereotyping. Call it intra-ethnic humor, for lack of a better term, could actually be a very helpful tool, I think, for, um, for negotiating an immigration society and for actually taking some of the tension out that there is. And humor is, in any walk of life, a way to release tension. Today's episode is brought to you by Glitter Pig. This glossy hog brings you good luck for the new year. May you avoid being canceled in 2024. Link, link. Glitter Pig supports our program by pledging us handfuls of shiny, shiny acorns each month on Patreon. And so can you. Well, we'd be better off with like three euros a month or whatever amount you can afford to chip in with. For these, you'll get access to bonus materials, early releases. You also get to send us questions and recommend topics for us. So please sign up at patreon.com slash Eurozine. That is Eurozine, the presenting partner of this show. Thanks. And now back to Talking Smack. You did these sort of sensitivity classes or conversations with school children. Scholars of migration tend to start with the statement that we all come from a migration background. But now as a, as a scholar yourself and sort of a second generation immigrant to Germany, you found that not everybody comes equally from, <laughs> from a migration background. And that it seems that for instance, second generation migrants tend to stay in place more than others do. Uh, that's true. I mean, that's that's so far more of a more of a um, anecdotal observation that I have. But 
Um, yeah, but when this show airs, it's like the 30th of December, so everybody's hungover. I think it can pass. As migration scholars, migration historians, this is, this is like a favorite line. You know, everybody, like, migration is part of the human condition. Everybody is a migrant, which is objectively not true. A lot of people have not any sort of active migration experience, and a lot of those who are migrants in one generation then actually stay put, and their kids stay put. Like, if, if I can throw in another anecdote here, when, when, when I was a kid in the 1980s, 1990s, rural Germany, there were some pretty bad racist, anti-Semitic, you name it, jokes out there. I'm not going to tell them here, because those are definitely beyond the pale. Those were never funny. Um, I think by now you couldn't easily talk like that anymore. Or you have to become better at telling these. If you're going to make a joke about something like someone else's ethnic background, you actually have to, I think a lot of the time you have to actually, one, know something about that background that's not just a shallow surface level understanding of, of, uh, of their identity and because I feel like a lot of the time uh, the tension is broken when you make a joke that could potentially be offensive when it's actually smart like people don't get mad about offensive jokes when they're funny that's that's the truth it's people don't get mad about offensive jokes if they're like smart and well written funny is like a moving goalpost and then there's an element of witty that we expect yes, in a joke that's what to I mean. be to have a bit more of a depth not necessarily like deep in this dramatic sense but yeah. have a bit of a yeah. nuance that we recognize have yeah. a, have an edge exactly and and the punchline i would hope that, that the punchline we expect today would go beyond, <laughs> it turns out they were gay, yeah, or something like this, exactly. right? One of the funniest people that have ever been on a screen, Eddie Murphy, his first fantastical stand-up has a couple of very, to, by today's standards, very poor gay jokes, which he, I believe, has already said that wouldn't make today. Mm -hmm. But back in the 80s, at the height of the AIDS crisis, they counted as funny, and today they feel different. Even though this is a, a, like an, an outstanding comedian with a very good deliverance. I, mean, I think that's just sort of proof of, first of all, there's the phrase that comedy is the genre that ages the fastest and the least, um, the least well. It doesn't speak well to uh, Eddie Murphy's uh, belief system at the time, of course, but he was I, also like 19 or something. Yeah, so maybe we can cut young. him some slack. Yeah. Humor changes, but in general, sort of the cultural repertoire that people have changes, and as you said, it changes very quickly. I don't think anyone has tried to sort of cancel Eddie Murphy for that, right? So it's like, okay, it's something that you thought was funny at the time. We don't do that anymore, and but we have to renegotiate the present. How do we treat certain texts from the past that we still read? which contain offensive words. With, like, you know, Shakespeare, uh, specifically about Jews and women. Yeah. You can't change the past. You can't change what people wrote at the time. Of course, you can recontextualize it, but you cannot and you should not sort of try and change this and make it sort of um, digestible mm -hmm. for the present. Because it's, you know, at least as an historian, I would say, you know, you, you shouldn't tamper with your sources. Or erase. So one genre that allows you to change the past is actually stand-up. So let's talk about assembling material. One thing that you, I, I always take as a rule of thumb is that punching down never ages well. Yes. Uh, punching up always ages well. If you go to, like, you know, Carlin, Pryor, wh whoever you pick from stand-up comedians, if you look at their material and they have some material that's, like, not really would not be okay nowadays, or it's every, it's every time it's because they have been punching down women or like minorities or something like that. I draw a lot of inspiration from my own past. I grew up in rural Austria. Uh, I grew up uh, with a lot of, you know, white friends but all my white friends had one non-white friend. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> and, I'm and, truly uh, braver than any U.S. Marine. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's not, most of it is not maliciously said to me. It's yeah. just people not knowing, being nervous in the conversation because they have never met somebody from another culture yeah. is a big part of it because that was, like, I was 
exotic in, in ruler uh, Salzburg uh, because uh, they knew Turks, they knew people from former Yugoslavia, and that's it. Like, and it was like, what, what the fuck are you? But it's interesting what you're saying that, you know, they knew Turks and they knew Yugoslav. And that actually shows the kind of change that has already happened. Because, I mean, 50 years ago, they wouldn't have known those people in yeah. rural Austria. So it's a constant, a constant renegotiation. You know, there's always someone, someone comes in who is kind of more ex the new sort of exotic yeah. kid in town. Um, and that, again, changes the constellation and former outsiders become insiders. I don't know, would you, if you had, um, maybe you would have had uh, Turks or Yugoslav also staring at you for being uh, from Afghanistan? No, or? they were just confused because they also didn't know anybody else. <laughs> they were like, what? <laughs> where, where, <laughs> where is that? <laughs> How did you get here? I talked with this young comedian, Dusan, from your comedy club, mm -hmm. who, uh, who is Serbian and has, a, has a, a set of jokes about how interchangeable the language, uh, languages are and who takes offense as what. And he says that he gets told all the time, because he's also part Bulgarian, that he looks like a Russian. And I can't even imagine what that means because we're talking about so many people over such a vast expense. Like, what does a Russian look like? Now, no, when I think about it, he really does. I'll tell you the answer to that question. It's a very, very strict stereotype of mostly what? invented. Vlad? Vlad? Yeah, Vlad. Literally looks like what I would say um, mostly Western Americans have formed of like, oh, bad guy who beats Rocky in a fucking fight or something. Sorry, am I allowed to curse? No, no, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> not sure I want to meet this guy. He's sounds scary. No, he's really, he's really very sweet. Cute. Yeah. Yeah, he's very nice. Nice guy. We're talking about punching up and punching down. I think what we're talking about now is actually sort of punching sideways, if yes. you will, right? And I think that's, that's again, that, that has, again, something to do with changes in society, that those who are down don't necessarily stay down. So I think it's actually healthy to an extent if at some point you can sort of make fun of such things sort of on, on, on eye level, you know? Yeah. Then it's not punching down, it's not punching up. It's really punching among equals, if you will. And uh, I mean, it's always it's contentious. What's you know what kind of equality you need? But you know this post-Yugoslav example, which is actually I mean also 30 years after a bloody war, kind of encouraging that you can sort of um, make light of certain things that you know that that turn into that that are stereotypes at the end of the day. But yeah, for instance, the stereotype that Montenegrins are supposed to be lazy, so have the laziest man in the world contest, where people lay about for, for days in a very strict set of rules to win this trophy, which I want to participate in, and somebody pay me for that amount of time, please. <laughs> I, I heard this amazing joke about Montenegrins being lazy. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't I, remember the joke? Although I do. I do. It's a very good joke. I'm not sure if it's, I should tell it. Basically, when Montenegro separated from Serbia, this joke came along, and it's like a, probably a very old joke, and it's about many different people. But in this case, I heard it in the context of Montenegro because they're yeah. said to be lazy, so that's the stereotype. And they, oh, yeah. the first, the first uh, like parliament meeting that they had, they had to set like the days, the days off, and the days to work. And they said, okay, Saturday, Sunday's off. Rest of the week is we will work. And somebody like raised their hand, and they're like, hey, wait a second, we do have Muslims here, and they want to have Fridays off, how about that? They're like, you know what, yeah, let's be inclusive, let's give them Fridays also off, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we will be off, other days we work. One guy raised his hand and said, look, after a three-day weekend, I think we should give people some time to recuperate from the weekend, <laughs> and they thought it was a good idea, so they're like, yeah, you know what, let's be, let's, be, let's, be, let's be innovative. Mondays, also off. And somebody said, well, before a three-day weekend, we should actually give people also to prepare themselves for the weekend. So they're like, yeah, okay, let's give them Thursdays also off. So like this, the days kept falling out. And at the end of the day, they were like, you know what? We will just do it very simply. Every day is off except for Wednesday. On Wednesdays, we work. And that, that was like, everybody's like, everybody fine with that? Everybody fine with that? And then like at the back seat, there was a guy and he raised his hand and he's like, excuse me, do we work on every Wednesday? <laughs> Now, that is my preferred work week. Ideal society right there. <laughs> the jokes that will be received the best by other people are things that you know about, 
things that you have experienced, things that you, you have to know about the subject matter to tell good jokes about it. So I don't tell jokes about like U Yugoslavia because I'm an ignorant American and I don't, I don't know all, I didn't know any of these stereotypes <laughs> until very recently. So as a, as a, as a minority, the, the entry point, how you enter a culture kind of defines your position in that yeah. culture. Yeah. I never thought I was a Karen, which is not... <laughs> Great way not to a, start a sentence, by the way. Not, not really a nice or pleasant thing to realize, but I did realize when I was going to get my e-card, mm -hmm. this is this health insurance card for non-Austrian viewers, get it renewed, and I went to the Magistrat, the, mm -hmm. the institution where you do all of these things, and there were a whole line of people with the buggies, with little children, on the side of a... I think like eight lane road on the Gürtel, waiting outside of the building. And I went there and I looked at them and I asked them, why don't you go in? And they just looked at me like I lost my mind. And then I realized, oh, we have a very different attitude to things because I, as an EU citizen, as an, and as a Hungarian who feels completely entitled to everything in Austria because you took it from us, I just like go through doors and tell, why do you make these families wait outside? <laughs> but interestingly, I mean, you, you call you, you use this sort of against yourself now. But why is it actually is it is it okay to call someone a Karen? Isn't that no? A very, I think it's is, okay. Is it okay? But oh, isn't yeah. that isn't that quite sexist actually? First of all, a Karen is most commonly understood to be a white woman who uses that privilege as a weapon against other pe people who are in lower positions to them. So any minority group, any, like, r someone working customer service at the register. Yeah, I think deep entitlement and rage. Yeah, rage. yeah, misplay. And, and again, you're, you're weapon. I think White most, rage, yeah. yeah. You're weaponizing, you're using your position of privilege to basically punch down. Karen also just so happens to be among the most popular names in North America for East Asian immigrants because it's so normal that there are a lot of Gen Z, second or third generation Americans with East Asian heritage who are called Karen, and now they're confronted with this, this stereotype. This is the reason why their parents choose their, or chose this name in the first place, because this sounded so very bland, normal American. You can be named Karen, you just should not be a Karen. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, Karen is just a state of mind. It's a vibe. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, I, I didn't know that though. That's really interesting because I've primarily associated. Like, I have an aunt Karen, like who is a Karen, also. Oh, that's a great combination. <laughs> <laughs> this show is made possible with the support of the European Union, the European Cultural Foundation, and our host, the Alte Schmiede Kunstverein. Culture and media need supporters, and they need space. The U.S. also has a different relationship with names, like in the country where I come from, or in Slovakia, you choose from a set. We have the little booklet. You have a set. You have a booklet? That's insane. Yes. The, no, we have the French were the first to come up with this, of course. Standardizing names, you know, it's, no, that's a they very... They are very fond of standards, aren't they? They are very All fond together. of standards. Not they invented the meter difference. and they invented... The um, liter. A and, meter and, and, this, and, and acceptable years. names. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, this is the moment where I go, fucking white people. <laughs> Uh, it used to be the booklet, which is a book of etymologies. So it's not meant for choosing the, the names. Lado fele magyar utónévkönyv for any Hungarian speaker, uh, speaking users, they would be familiar. This is the thing that you would page through and look for baby names. And you would find fantastic ones like old Hungarian names like Chörs, which means devil. So that's kind of bringing it down on yourself. What I have realized by watching comedy and, and watching comedians perform and stuff, if you are not from a culture and you make fun of that culture, you better know your shit. Mm -hmm. Because if you know details and if you know, and if the person from that culture knows that you know their culture, they will laugh extra hard and they feel seen and they feel, oh, you know about us and you know about this one thing that we have like an inside joke about and now you also understand it and then you become part of their culture became like a almost a genre of like making fun of minorities but in a way where you're like 
you are very knowledgeable in their culture, even know a bit of their language and know, but it's not like a malicious fun. It's like, hey, this is funny in your culture, right? Comedy has been, at least in the United States, sort of pioneered by a lot of Jewish immigrants and Jewish Americans. And I think about what uh, Mel Brooks mm -hmm. used to say. I don't mean to speak on behalf of, of uh, Jewish Americans, but I do think that it is worth noting that these guys are also concerned about stere like stereotyping their own culture because traditionally a lot of these stereotypes are used against them. Yeah. I wish that instead of reacting negatively to the comic of that culture, talking about their experiences, I wish that they would just take that and internalize it. I need to recognize that this is a stereotype and this is not necessarily reflective of everybody. You don't need to get mad at that person though for making fun of their experience. Comedy is very frequently a genre that lends itself to exaggeration. It's not a research point, but yes. it's an entry point to get interested in something you didn't know exactly. you would be interested. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah. And now that we finally get to talk about the Jews. <laughs> oh, no. I did, so oh, I come no. from this like ridiculously philosemitic peasant's family. My grandmother used to serve at Jewish houses, and, and this was kind of like an unspoken but very obvious thing that this is, these are the people that we hold dear in our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, this very much goes against a lot of stereotypes about yeah. East European peasants, if I may <laughs> yeah. say so. For in, a, in a small village. Everybody was going to the same school, they were friends, they were together all the time, so this is kind of like a, a heritage that I, I took with myself when I went to Budapest, which admittedly was a bigger shift mm -hmm. than going from Budapest to Vienna, to be honest, <laughs> despite the crossing the borders. And I picked up a lot of Yiddish style humor along the way. And, and it had been quite, quite some time until I kind of came up with a blend for myself, negotiating which jokes I can make and which jokes I can't. So now my strategy is to always attribute the joke to the person that I learned it from, so credit where it's due. It doesn't take away from the laughter that I cashed in anyway. If I say that <laughs> I learned it from a, uh, from a professor of mine, this is one of my favorites and probably like the most historical one. This is a joke from the early 90s from Israel, which says, if you see a Russian on the Israeli border and they don't have a violin, it's a pianist. <laughs> Do you find perfectly telling God of? I don't get it, but it's funny well, to me that it's a Someone who has lived in Israel and studied this kind of immigration, it's hilarious. Okay. okay. Because it's all the classical musicians, that, like Russia traditionally, and of course during the Soviet times too, was so strong in classical music on an industrial scale, really. Oh, that yeah. They are very heavily mass produced. And they yeah. all emigrated to Israel, and Israel like could have had 10 philharmonic orchestras in the 1990s. Hmm. I, I now understand this joke, and I will, uh, of course, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> context specific. Right? Yeah, it's very context. I told you I love draining jokes by explaining them. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's funny because in the Soviet Union they were mass produced. It was so much poverty. <laughs> this, is, this is my entire childhood, by the way, that you just reenacted. <laughs> actually, actually, the explanation is way more funnier than the joke itself. <laughs> Sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. It's like you. It's part of making the absurdity for people like us who don't are not already familiar with the with the uh, context that this is just it's another level there's humor on all levels I mean there I think you met since you mentioned Mel Brooks and sort of mm -hmm. casually bringing up one of my favorite uh, yeah, comedians a legend yeah. um, I mean there's he's a master of sort of layering the humor also in a way that like, my favorite movie of his Spaceballs mm -hmm. you know which mm -hmm. totally works on just like on the level of being a spoof of Star Wars, of course, but sort of, if you go deeper, like there's all this Yiddish humor, there humor, there are all these yes. jokes, and you know, in the, in the end, there's this. Um, I think it's the end of, at the end of Spaceballs, where it's like, you know, the Jews in space. Yes, yes, I remember. And I mean, this is this is you know really walking a thin line there, like sort of alluding, I imagine, even to 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 the Muppet Show pigs in space. So you know, like mm. really, really. Pushing, pushing the boundaries there and having Jews flying around in, uh, in Star of David-shaped spaceships. I mean, it's, it's, 
you know, yeah. it's, 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 it's even an example, I think, of someone who, with jokes in relatively bad taste, <laughs> sort of manages to, to break up stereotypes, you know? And, and but I do think that since this is a show about offensive humor, we should talk about Blazing Saddles for a second. Blazing Saddles was a movie about, uh, it, it was a parody of like Old West films, and the protagonist was a black sheriff. And a lot of the jokes were basically just the fact that everyone was racist towards him. But I liked what Mel Brooks had to say about, um, he was like, I would never show uh, a black person being lynched because that's, that's not funny. That's horrifying. Mm. Um, and it's, I would never make a joke that like, sh like shows like the brutalization or violence of, of uh, people like this. I will make fun of the racism that has to do with that. Movies like that, especially like Mel, Mel Brooks movies, yeah, yeah. you have to watch them like every 10 years. Mm. They're like a good, like a canary in the gold mine of showing like, oh, okay, how far away, like, like a good indicator of society yeah. comedy on stage was always something that the oppressed, slightly outcasted minorities did. And that's how like Jewish humor became a thing. Actually, I, somebody told me, and I have not verified this, so like that, like the, one of the first people who are considered a stand-up comedian were here in Vienna, who were like a band leader, and uh, they would tell jokes in between, you know, the songs. Entertainment as sort of like an external um, thing to well, normalcy is always something that outcasts or people from a, uh, from a disadvantaged position could seek out for themselves if, if they don't want to remain underneath. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go as far as say most creative fields lend themselves well to uh, like minority groups who yeah, have experienced yeah, right. oppression because there's, there's a lot to say about, like they, they, they are a group of people that have something to say. I'm biased, of course, as a comedian. I feel like it's one of the better ways to uh, <laughs> to to uh, not necessarily view the world, but to at least share your experiences in the world. Are you berating operas and their social potential now? <laughs> I was a musicology student, so uh, I feel oppressed by most opera. No, most of the things you say. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, I actually think there there are some pretty funny operas, actually, like uh, Marriage of Figaro. I love that one, too, because that one's kind of punk rock. Like, they, they did not want Mozart making Marriage of Figaro because it has a lot of themes of, like, class struggle. Comedy as a genre is probably the most honest way of, of portraying what our current societal values are. It's not always pretty. It's not always it's not always something that we believe is right, but it's most certainly the most direct, most straightforward way to know who do we like, who do we not like, what do we think of this, where is the power, where where is the money? Look, that would be a very elevated closing, and I don't want that. <laughs> Yanis, you have anything really stupid on your mind? Oh, I love stupid jokes. For instance, since I just saw, on the way here, I saw on the tram, they, they said that, that it, today is the anniversary of the Beatles releasing their white album. So, uh, what is yellow and plays the guitar? John Lemon. <laughs> yeah, that was stupid. <laughs> See? She asked See, for it. Proof that even in academia, <laughs> <laughs> especially our, especially in academia, our finest minds, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the most scientific director I know. <laughs> Ashlyn, anything anything real stupid? A uh, horse walks into a bar. That's weird. That's it. That's the joke. That's the only <laughs> the version of this horse work walks into a bar type of uh, joke that I like the best is like, you know, there's all these like iterations on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And the one that I really loved as a child is that a whole horse walks into a bar, walks up the wall, through the ceiling, down the wall, goes to the bar, asks for a beer, drinks the beer, walks back up the wall, through the ceiling, down the wall, out the door, and a guest 
looks at the bartender and, and look in like amazement, like what just happened? And then the bartender says, yeah, he's like that. He never says hi. <laughs> that's okay. relatable though <laughs> okay that's a very stupid place to end on thank you so much everybody you can see these guys at Gays and Days and the Comedy Pub in Vienna and you can see Yanis often at all sorts of events of Recet all of these are going to be linked in the show notes thanks everyone and uh, have a great change of calendars This show is presented by Eurozine, a platform offering insightful articles from over a hundred partner journals in multiple languages. You can be a part of this intellectual journey by visiting patreon.com slash Eurozine to become a patron starting at just three euros per month. For this, you'll get access to bonus materials, early releases and further perks. Our show is a production of Display Europe, an innovative platform dedicated to presenting content with a strong focus on data privacy. We're also grateful to the Alte Schmiede for hosting us. Funding for this program comes from both the Creative Europe program of the EU and the European Cultural Foundation. The opinions and views expressed here are those of the authors and the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the EU or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency.